me just read to you, as I start off this morning, a, a couple of letters written by men. One is a father honoring uh, his father, and the other one is a father writing uh, a letter to his son. But as we go through the message today, uh, the question I want to place before you is, and we saw it in the video, a little mention of it, who is your father? And as we uh, think about fathers on this Father Day, as you would think about uh, your father, whether he is a part of your life now or whether he uh, is not for whatever reason, it can conjure up different uh, emotions in each one of us. But here is a, a tribute a, a pastor wanted to pay to his father, actually uh, Pastor Paul Shepherd. He wrote, I feel honored to carry both his natural and spiritual DNA. I'm so glad and blessed that I was raised by two people who knew the Lord and loved the Lord, and who raised their children in the instruction and training of the Lord. I'm so glad I was raised by folk who weren't confused about their role as parents. They knew a parent's job is to prepare a child for a quality life. They knew it didn't just mean make sure they get a good education, although they ensured that we did. They knew that it didn't just mean more than just having a general sense of how to treat other people, but they knew first and foremost that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I am glad I was raised by folk who weren't confused by that. I feel sorry today for folk who are a little confused as to what they are to do. I see people now confused if they are to talk to their children about the things of God. I was raised in a household of faith by people who knew that... Sorry, I, I was raised in a household of faith by people who knew that they couldn't force salvation upon us or force Christ on us, but they did raise us intentionally on the word of God and their attitude was, we can't guarantee that you will be saved while you are in our house, but we will guarantee that it will be tough to be a sinner in this house. <laughs> and you get saved when the Lord convicts your heart, but in the meantime, know that this is a household of faith and there are some things that you can't get involved in simply because you're last of your last name and your address. They trained us and loved us and nurtured us in the things of God. And as a result, my parents are blessed with five adult children who know and love the Lord for ourselves because we were raised in a household of faith. What a, what a powerful, powerful testimony you shared in part of a sermon, actually, entitled A Tribute to My Father. Here's another letter from a father to a son. Could hardly believe you are already 40. Time really flies. Just to say how happy I am, and I give glory and praise to God for you. My reason for saying this is that where there is the absence of an earthly father in a child's life, there is great difficulty for that child to connect up with the Heavenly Father. But this is not the case with you. And I thank God daily for his loving kindness in calling you into his ministry. I am deeply sorrowful and apologetic for my absence in your early life. I was not there when your mom gave birth to you. I was already here in Canada to make matters worse, I was not there for most of your early years. I have failed you as an earthly father, so I can quite understand your shying away from me. I am fully to be blamed, and daily I ask God's forgiveness for being such a delinquent dad. And that's just part of a letter that my father wrote to me. Back in 2008, he passed away in 2014. And while uh, God did do a work of forgiveness in my heart, there was never a full 
a reconciliation or restoration of that relationship. And I don't know at which end of the spectrum you may be today as you would uh, think of your father if it's when you think about your father if it's something that brings frustration to your heart um, brokenness anger um, if there's unforgiveness there or when you think about your father that there's joy there you you remember the good times that you had together you remember the things your father would have taught you and the places your father would have have brought you and so we understand in our society today there is such a, a wide range of emotions when it comes to thinking about fathers and fatherhood in general. It's written that the number one reason teens keep the faith as young adults is because there are mothers and fathers who practice what they preach and preach what they practice that's by far the major influence on young people coming to faith and remaining in the faith. Statistics say here just 1% of teens ages 15 to 17 raised by parents who attach little importance to religion were highly religious in their mid to late 20s. Just 1% of teens who had faith emphasized in their life by the time they enter into their 20s, only 1% of those individuals are actually living out a faith to God. While in contrast, 82% of children raised by parents who talked about faith at home attached great importance to their beliefs and were active in their congregations were themselves religiously active as young adults. Look at that difference. 1% where there was no um, parent in the home where uh, spoke about faith and the things of God compared to 82% of young people who ended up serving God because they came from a household of faith. We are truly privileged, those of us who know the Lord, to raise our children in the knowledge and understanding of the Lord because there are so, so many benefits to it. A statement here that's also recorded says, no other conceivable causal influence comes remotely close to matching the influence of parents on the religious faith and practices of youth. Smith said in a recent talk sharing the findings at Yale Divinity School, he ends the quote with, parents just dominate. God has given to us as parents, and specifically we're focusing our attention on fathers, God has given us a, a God-given authority you could use the word anointing. You could use the word gifting. You could use the word positioning. You could use the word influential power into the lives of our children to be a blessing unto them. But the problem is this. When we fail to live up to whom God has called us to be as fathers, there can be detrimental results in the lives of children. And statistics, you would look across the board, these are American statistics, but I'm pretty sure it's pretty much the same here in Canada. Just a few statistics to show you, Father, this is how important you are to society. One of the major problems in society today are homes that are fatherless. Father deprivation is a more reliable predictor of criminal activity than race, environment, or poverty. Think about that. The number one thing that drives these types of negative behaviors is not whether or not you are poor. It's not what race you are from. It's not even the environment that you live in. But it's whether or not there was a father in the home. This is one of the greatest determining factors. Father deprived children are. Let me just give you a few statistics. 72% of all teenage murderers come from a home without a father. 70% of children who have been incarcerated, who are in prison, come from homes without a father. Children who are raised in homes without a father are twice as likely to quit school, 11 times more likely to be violent, 
Three of four teens who commit suicide come from homes without a father. And, and this one is, is another shock. I mean, all of these are quite shocking. 90% of runaways come from homes without a father. And 80%, 80% of adolescents in psychiatric hospitals come from homes without a father. This shows that God had an original intent for the father in the place of the home and in the raising of their children. Because when the father is not there, there can be all types of emotional difficulties and challenges. There can be all types of financial challenges. It's well known that single parent homes, homes without a father, earn way less income than homes which have both mother and father in it. And so if you, like me, grew up in a single parent home, I thank God for my mom. I thank God for the excellent job that she did. I'm the last of 10 children. And I can testify that the lack of a father in a home did make a difference in my life. And I didn't realize that until I actually got a little bit older. I remember something that happened when I was just five years old. We used to live on top of a store. And so we were on the second, uh, second story of this building and uh, something happened and there was a fire. And uh, my father happened to be in the house at that time. But I recall, and even from talking to my brothers and sisters and my mom afterwards, that basically he just took all of his stuff and he ran out of the house and forgot about all of us children. I remember going trying to go down the front stairs and it was, it was nothing but smoke and my, my brothers and sisters had to come and get me and, and we had to escape out through the back exit and, and I, I think about that sometimes that I, I could have died at just five years of age because of the neglect of a father, a father who just didn't care, a father who just wanted to live his own life and went off and actually uh, had another family somewhere else and forget forgot all of his original children. And as you heard in the letter I read, uh, there was some remorse in later years that he experienced because of that behavior. And so when the father's not in the home, you're facing challenges. You're, the odds are more stacked against you than if you have a good father in the home. Now, some of you may have had a, had a father in your home who was detached emotionally or perhaps uh, abusive. I mean, there, there can be just such a wide range of your interactions with your father when you were growing up. And this can leave scars in our lives. Now, this can leave wounds that last for years and years and years. And even to this day, there might not be a healing to that. Uh, last week, I know Pastor mentioned about how he likes to ride bicycles. And as a kid, I used to like to ride my bike as well. Probably the difference between me and your pastor is I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> because I crashed so many times. And I, I crashed into cars. I remember one time I was, you know, you like to ride fast as a kid. And I decided I was going to try to turn. But as I was making that turn, I was going too fast. And the sidewalk was there. And well, you know what happened. I went, my bike wheel, the front wheel, hit that curb straight on, and it was my first time thinking I was Superman because I just went flying through the air. And you know, sometimes when it just seems like you know something bad's about to happen and everything just seems to slow down and it's going in slow motion, and I'm going through the air and I'm thinking, this is going to hurt. This is going to hurt. And all what I remember is doing a belly flop right onto the pavement. And nobody was around. Eventually, I just got up back on my bike and rode home. But another time, I crashed close to home. And this time when I fell, I fell into some type of a bush, and it went straight into my thigh. And when I got up and I looked, there was a, a hole, like the length of my finger here, right in my thigh. And I could actually see the white of my flesh 
And I was just kind of so in shock. I wasn't even feeling pain. So, of course, you know, I, I get up and I go home and I'm straight to mom and crying and, and all of that. And, and mom takes care of me and, and patched it up. But that was an open wound. Today, that wound is sealed. I still have the scar, a big scar across my thigh, the length of, like I said, my, my little finger. And each time I look down, I'm, I'm reminded of, of that fall. But I'm also reminded that a scar which was once opened and where I could see the flesh, a wound that was, that was painful at that time, had now been healed. And I believe that this is what God wants to do. If, if when you think about who is your father, if there is an open wound even to this day, know that God wants to bring healing to that wound. So I want us to look at three scriptures very quickly. The first one being Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. And this is when Jesus got up in the synagogue and he read this portion of scripture, was from, which was from the book Isaiah. And this is what Jesus said, and this defined his ministry. This defined his mission of what he came to do. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit is upon me. The same Spirit of God that you would read about in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, when it says that when God created the heavens and the earth, that the earth was void and without form, and that the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. That which was in darkness, that which seemed to be in a state of complete disarray. From the very opening chapters of the Bible, we see God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, his role was to bring to order and to bring into alignment, according to the Word of God, that which God, that which God has declared. And Jesus is now coming on the scene, God in the flesh, the Son of God, who came and lived a sinless life. He is now proclaiming his public ministry. This is what he has caused me and called me to do. He has placed an anointing upon me to preach the gospel to the poor. Who are the poor? That word there, poor, can actually be translated as those who are distressed in a state of distress, emotionally, things are not well with you. Jesus said, I have come to preach, and the word there, gospel, means good news. We carry something which is good news to those who are in a state of distress. He says, I have come to heal the brokenhearted, and while some versions don't have to heal the brokenhearted in it, it is also wrapped up in the meaning of to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Oppressed there means to be crushed, to be broken. And it says he has come to set them free, to pardon them from things that have happened to them in their life that have crushed them, be it from their own sin and their own poor decisions in life, or be it through the poor decisions that others have made that have affected them negatively, whether it was years ago when you were growing up or whether it was yesterday, somebody did something to you and it has crushed you. It has caused you to be in a position where you feel like you have been walked over. Jesus said, I have come into your life to help you not only deal with that situation, but to set you free from all of those negative emotions that are attached to it. He said, I've come to proclaim liberty to the captives. That word liberty there actually means in the context of someone who's in prison, someone who may be guilty, and you've been locked up in prison. And in the United States, there's something called a presidential pardon, where the president can write a, an executive order or whatever it is they call it. He can write a presidential pardon, and he can say, you as a prisoner are allowed to be set free. You can go back and you can continue living your life. You no longer have to remain in confinement. And this is the language that Jesus was using. He was saying, those of you who feel like you are in a prison, 
There is something that happened to you in your life of which you had no control over. Or you were running with the wrong crowd and, and things just happened. And you find yourself now in a place, be it a physical prison or be it an emotional prison. Jesus said, here, I have written down your name. I have declared pardon for your life. Whatever sin you have committed against God, I have come to let you know that through me, you can have forgiveness of that sin and you can go free. You can leave the guilt. You can leave the shame. You can leave the heartache. You can leave the frustration. You can leave every single thing that is holding you back in life if you would just receive this pardon that I'm offering to you. It's a free gift. We see an example in the scripture where the role of a father helped to play a tremendous role in the pardon of a young man's life. And many of you are familiar with it in Luke chapter 15. I'll just put three of the verses up there. Um, we'll just see that on the board. This is the story of the prodigal son. Most of you would be familiar with it. A father has two sons, an older one and a younger one. And the younger one says... Give me my inheritance, what's due to me. He, he no longer wanted to remain under his father's roof. He wanted to go out and live his life. And so, amazingly, the father says, yes, I don't know about you, but <laughs> if, if that was me, I'm saying, no, you want to go, you go. But the inheritance stays here because you got to be a part of this household. But this father is gracious and permits the son to make a wrong decision. Uh, parents, sometimes when our children get older, we have raised them as best as we could. We have had the talk or talks with them, telling them about decisions to make in life and, and the type of character you should have and the type of life you should as aspire to. And we can do our best, but there's still no guarantee. You see, the, one of the most vulnerable relationships you will find is the relationship between a parent and a child. The child is at the most vulnerable because they're in a position of powerless, really, as they are growing up. But we ourselves as parents, as our children get older, we become vulnerable as well because we've invested our lives in them. We have done our best. We have have, have put, tried to put everything in place so that they can succeed in life, but there is a chance, there's always a possibility that that child is going to turn their back upon you. And you would say, but why? I, I've provided everything that I can. Why have they decided to go down the wrong road? Why have they rejected my love? Why have they rejected all that I have provided for them all of these years? Don't they see? Don't they understand? Everything that I have sacrificed, I have, I have kept back from myself so that they could have more in life. And as parents so often, our thoughts are just upon our children. We get up in the morning and we go to work because we're thinking of our children. We want to provide for them. We want to meet their needs. We want them to have a better life than we ourselves have had. And so here is a father who gives the son his inheritance. And the son goes and riotous living, spends and wastes all of it. And says the land where he was, there was a famine. And he had nothing to eat, and he found himself amongst the pigs. And in the context of a Jewish person, those pigs would have been unclean, but he was there, imagine, in a, in a pen, pig pen, fighting off the pigs to eat whatever those pigs were eating. I mean, think of how low he had come, what a low point he had arrived to, in his life. So this is where we pick it up in this scripture when it says, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? It took him hitting rock bottom before he came to his senses and realized what he had left behind. So often, young people can take for granted everything their mother, their father has provided for them, and they think of it as nothing. And they can squander it away, and they don't regard it in a high esteem until they reach a point in their life 
where they have been stripped down and the plans that they had, everything has just crumbled. Everything has, in other words, they have come to a place where they are as those individuals Jesus came to minister to, where he said they were poor, distressed. They were oppressed. They were crushed. This young man was now in a prison. He had such need. He was hungry. And it was at that point he shook himself and said, wait, 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 wait. What am I doing here? Sometimes we have to do that in our lives. Like, what am I doing here? Things might be well in certain areas of your life, but you find yourself in a position where nothing seems to be working. There just seems to be a hunger. There just seems to be a lack. And, and you shake yourself and you say, this isn't what God intended for my life. This isn't God's plan for me. My father owns everything. And we can come back to Luke 4 and 18, and we can make a, a personal application to our lives. But Jesus, you came so that if I find myself in this position, you will be able to set me free. You will be able to open doors that have been closed. You will be able to heal my broken heart. You will be able to open my eyes to see God's provision for my life. You will direct my paths, and you will show me the way. So this is what he said. He said, I will arise. And go to my father. Oh, he, he's on the right track now. He said, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. You see, when we hit rock bottom, we need to acknowledge the sin that got us there. We need to acknowledge if we've made a poor decision. We need to acknowledge if we've been holding unforgiveness and bitterness towards others. And so we find ourselves in a grieving and angry state whenever we think about that individual or specifically if it's a father that we're talking about today. And he said, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Here we see this young man's identity now has been totally messed up. No longer thinks he's worthy to be called his father's son. All that I am worthy to be called is a servant. In other words, I've lost my position. I, I can't attain it back, but father, just take me into your house so at least... I'll have food to eat, I'll have, I'll have shelter, and I, I will be happy with having way less than what I started with originally. Aren't you glad that the father in this story did not accept his son's proposal of just come back as a servant? As you would read on, you would read that the father saw him from afar off. The father was looking out for him. And the father embraced him, ran to him, and embraced him. I imagine that boy must have smelled because he was amongst the pigs and he had nothing to eat. He was filthy. But the father embraced him, put the best robe on him, put a ringer on his finger, restored him to that position that he had even before he had left. Forgave him for rejecting him and saying, give me my inheritance. And all of that money was gone and it wasn't coming back. The father pardoned him, forgave him of all of his wrongs and said, it's time to rejoice. It's time to be merry for this son whom I had was lost. He was as if he was dead to me, but now he is alive once again. And as we know, Jesus was painting in this parable a picture of our heavenly father who is there waiting with open arms, ready to heal those open wounds in your life, ready to forgive you of all of your sins, ready to restore you to the proper identity in him. You're not just a hired servant. You are a child of the living God. And God is pleading with you. If you are not in right standing with him, he's saying, come home, my son. Come home, my daughter. And I am going to restore to you everything that you have lost because you have gone your own way. But it starts with yourself. You see, genuine healing cannot come in your life unless you take your eyes off of yourself and you place it on God himself. And recognize that God is your father. What does that actually mean when we say God is your father? God is my father. Well, we had an earthly mother and an earthly father who was responsible for this physical body. 
But the Bible declares that God is the father of all spirits. In other words, that immaterial part of you, your soul, your character, your emotions, your spirit and your soul, God himself gave that to you. The Bible tells us that when a person dies, the spirit leaves and goes back to God who gave it. So there is a part of you that was created by God, your soul, that, that part of you, your actual being of who you actually are, you were created by God. But what happens? Things happen in this world. We can find ourselves growing up in bad situations and our spirit can become wounded. Emotionally, we can become damaged. But the Father who originally gave you a spirit that was meant to be one with him bids us to come back. And anytime we find ourselves and there is a restlessness within us, God is saying, come back to me. I've, I've got the answer. I'm, I'm the original maker. I am your Father. And I know exactly how to heal you. The three things God wants to do as we wrap this up in your life, depending on where you are. Number one, he wants to restore. We see that in the story of the prodigal son. Number two, he wants to remove anything in your life that is hindering you. Your heavenly father wants to remove it. And number three, he wants to release you. He has a plan. He has a destiny for your life. And when you enter into relationship with him, you can be released into what the father has planned for you. Restore, remove, release. Let's close with this final scripture that's found in Romans chapter 4. And we read it at the beginning of the service where it's speaking about Abraham. Originally called Abram, he had no children. In Genesis chapter 12, when God appeared to Abram, God said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Those who bless you, I will bless those who curse you, I will curse. And Abram was about 75 years old at that time. And he had no children with his wife, Sarah. And years passed and Abram, you know, wasn't seeing the promise being fulfilled. And they came up with their own scheme. And, uh, you know, the wife says, well, why don't you take your handmaiden and go with her and and have a son, and they have this son called Ishmael, but that was not the son of promise. That was not what God had intended. And so Abraham's like 99 years old, close to 100 years old, and God appears to them and by an angel and lets them know that the promise is going to be fulfilled. Sarah, you're going to have that son. And so here in Romans, it's like a recap of the faith of Abraham. And there's a connection to us, to his faith. He had to wait a long time for that promise to be fulfilled. But this is what it says. For Abraham is father of us all. What does that mean? It means we can trace our spiritual roots back to this individual. So let's see what this man called Abraham did in his situation and see how we can draw from that because the Bible is saying he's the father of us all. It says here, he's not our racial father. That's reading the story backward. He is our father faith father. Abraham was first named father and then became a father because he dared to trust God to do what only God could do. Are you willing today to say, God, I am trusting you to do exactly what we read Jesus came to do, to bring healing and restoration in my life, to remove those things in my life that have caused me such pain and discomfort and to release me into the plan, into the peace that you have for my life? Are we willing to look to God and say, God, only you're able to do it because I've tried to think positively. I've tried to forget about it. I've tried to push this thing out of my mind. But Lord, it's still there. It's still plaguing me. But today, would you do as your father Abraham did? Would you be willing to dare to trust God, to do what only God could do. And look what it says. Raise the dead to life with a word. Make something out of nothing. All God has to do is speak that word over your life, into your life. 
And that word will enter into your heart and you grab it by faith and you say, Lord, I believe you can heal me. Lord, I believe you can open those doors. Lord, I believe you can make a change in my family. Lord, I believe you can bring back that child who has rejected me after I loved him all these years. But now, Lord, I believe you can bring back and restore that relationship. Look what it says. It said, when everything was hopeless, I, I, I so, I'm so encouraged by this passage of scripture. Because you could be in the most hopeless situation. And the scripture is here saying, Abraham, when everything appeared hopeless, Abraham believed anyways, deciding to live not on the basis of what he saw he couldn't do, but on what God said he would do. I'm not living my life based upon what I can do to work this thing out. I'm going to live my life based on what God has promised. I'm going to continue to believe God in this thing. I mean, this man was like 100 years old. His wife was like 99 years old. They were well beyond the age of being able to bear children. It was a hopeless, impossible situation. But only God could have brought forth that child. Only God could have watched over his word to perform it. And so it says, and so he was made father of a multitude of peoples. My goodness. And it says this wasn't just written for, for about Abraham, but this was written to encourage us. As we wrap up this message, Perhaps God has stirred some things in your heart today. Some area in your life, perhaps you just closed that door. I know what I did growing up because my father wasn't around. I just said it didn't matter. I got my mom, I got my brothers and my sisters. It doesn't matter he wasn't around. My life was, was okay. Could have had more. Things could have been better. But, you know, I wasn't in jail or, or anything like that. But it was when I came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior that the Lord actually started to show me that I was carrying a spirit of rejection upon myself. There was, there was like a heaviness. There was a cloud over my life I didn't even realize was there until I came to know the love of my heavenly Father. And then I saw that something that should have been provided in my life as a child by my earthly Father, it was not there. And so I felt rejected. And, I, and, and there was something in the back of my mind. Why didn't he love us? Why, why didn't he care? It, it was something that was nagging, but I would just push it out of my mind. And there was a sense of rejection that I felt. But God healed all of that. And there's different ways he can do it. When I went off to Bible college and I moved from Montreal to Trinidad, he placed me in the home of my uncle. And it was in a time of prayer that the Lord spoke to me and said, I've placed you here in your uncle's home so that you would know what it is like to have a father in the home who would love you and care for you. And that brought such healing in my life. There was just like a cloud, a heaviness, a darkness. It just lifted from me. And, and brothers and sisters, I felt so light. So I, I felt something supernatural that I had never felt my entire life. It's like growing up and living your life having never seen the sunshine and then one day, suddenly, boom, you see the sun. And it's like, wow, this is amazing. I had never experienced such a freedom in my life. I didn't even know that I was in a prison until God had revealed it to me. And God did works of, of forgiveness in my heart and, and so many different things. Brothers and sisters, I can tell you today that this is true. Whatever it is that has hindered you, the Father loves you and cares for you. He is the Father of your spirit and of your soul. And he has come to nurture you back to health where you need to be. And so can we just close our eyes for a moment? With all of your heads bowed, you know if God has stirred anything in your heart today. Some of you, perhaps, you are one of those single parents, a single mom and and, and maybe that father has caused you so much, the father of your children has caused you so much frustration and, and anger and just made life difficult for you. And it's, it's so tough for you. God wants to touch you today. 
perhaps you had a, a, an abusive father. And I, I want to be very, very sensitive because things can just go so deep. But if that's your situation, continue to cry out to God. Let God touch you and heal you. He, he can lift that spirit of rejection and, and, and self-blame and self-hatred. He can lift that from your life today. Perhaps you're here and you're grieving the loss of, of a father or the lack of relationship that you had or, or, or perhaps your father actually did something to you that damaged you emotionally and there's some hatred and bitterness in your heart. God wants to touch you and God wants to heal you. Perhaps you are a father and you feel like you have failed your children. Perhaps because of the breakdown of a relationship, you no longer have the access to them that you would desire to have. And, and, and I want to encourage you to trust God to, to open up those doors and, and, and to, con to try to make a way for you to be able to reconnect with your children. Whatever the situation may be, if God is speaking something to your heart and he showed you an area of brokenness, Jesus has come and he said, the Holy Spirit is here. I've come to tell you good news. You don't need to remain in your brokenness. You don't need to remain in your distress, in your confusion. Perhaps you're a young person or a person who has strayed away from God. You've made poor decisions in your life and you feel like you've made a mess of your life and you're no good to God anymore. No, no, no. We see how the prodigal was welcomed back by his father. God still loves you. There's nothing you can do to make God stop loving you. That's one of the things we learn from that parable. And so stop this self-hatred. You have been created by a loving God who still wants to welcome you home and you can come back to him and you can be restored and forgiven of all of your sin and enter into right relationship with him. And as he starts to work in your life, he can start to restore the broken relationships in your life as well. So let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, just thank you, Lord, for each person that's here, each person that's heard your word today. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you watch over the word of God to perform it. You who hovered over the chaos of the earth, Lord God, and, and as you spoke forth, let there be light, light came forth. Your spirit did it. And Lord, I pray, I speak into the hearts of individuals today who are broken, who have put on a, a good face, a good front in front of people. But Lord, deep down inside, you know that inner struggle. You know their fears. You know their brokenness. In this sanctified moment, touch them in the depths of their being and restore to them that which has been lost. Bring them back to you. Cause them to come to their senses if they need to come to their senses and to return to you, Father. Lord, heal the brokenness, the wounds. Oh, Lord God, if there's any open wounds, things people have done to them or said to them or rejected them, Lord God, broken relationships, areas in their life that have failed where, Lord God, things did not turn out of the, as they had planned and, Lord, they feel a sense of hopelessness like dreams have died. Lord, Abraham believed that you were even, even able to bring the dead back to life. And so, Lord, give them that faith. Cause them to look to you. And I pray, Spirit of God, right now, that you would minister healing in each life that needs it. In the name of Jesus. And that, Lord, you would raise us up as agents of healing. That wherever we go, we would carry your presence. Lord, you want to redeem the negative things that have happened in our life. And you want to give us a testimony that God is able to take you from the deepest pit and to bring you to the highest point that he has for us. Lord, redeem all of the negative things. What the enemy went, meant for evil, Lord, you mean it for good. And so we pray that you would turn it around even right now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Bless the Lord. Amen. That um, that message really touched me. It's a, a beautiful, wonderful message. Um, stand with me. I'd like you to. Um, uh, bow your heads and uh, 
Um, if, uh, if this is uh, something that is, uh, has touched you as well, I want you to pray this prayer with me. I want you to repeat this prayer to me after me. Uh, God, you care deeply for broken-hearted people. God, you care deeply for broken-hearted people. This is a promise you make. This is a promise you make. You are close. You are close. We pray for all those who are crippled by broken relationships. Our hearts take the blow of disappointment. Our hearts take the blow of disappointment. We feel crushed because of our hopes are dashed. We feel crushed because of our hopes are dashed. God heal broken hearts. God heal broken hearts. We cannot fix our own wounds. We cannot fix our own wounds. But you can. But you can. If pieces of our hearts have been lost. Or are held captive by another, recover them and bring them back to us and miraculously put us back together so that our heart is whole again. You are a mender of broken hearts. We ask for this miracle in the name of Jesus. Amen.